All right, we're live. Um, John is what is the, I'm not sure what John is doing this week. I think he's out of town or something. Uh, yet another Renaissance festival, I think. Is that right? They're doing those things again. Um, so sitting in is Derek from Mac Folklore Radio. Hi, everybody. Sorry, you have to look at my face. face. This is why I have a podcast. <laughs> Good morning, everybody out there in the chat. A lot of uh, familiar, I was going to say faces. I guess they're just names here. I forget who it was. Some, uh, it was last week I was wearing the shirt that was the um, back to school shirt with the MacBook 12 or Mac PowerBook 12 inch and the, the mini. Somebody pointed out in the comments that that they had started working at the Apple stores when that promotion was going on. This week is an iPad shirt. Um, it's funny, I guess. So they were wearing these shirts. This one says, a magical and revolutionary product at an unbelievable price. Hopefully unbelievable in a good way. <laughs> and uh, I don't think there's nothing on the back, but it does have a, an Apple logo on the on the shoulder. It's amazing going through my closet to see how many of these shirts that I wound up picking up over the years. Oh, God. I wish I still had my Power Macintosh shirt from 1994. It's set on the back, or set on the back of the front. I want a Macintosh that's way past Wicked Fast, has to do more and cost less. And oh, yeah, I want it now. It wasn't a killer shirt, but uh, I do miss that thing. And that was an official Apple shirt? It was. It was. I also had a. Uh... Okay, I'm going to get angry at Cisco systems here. I helped out at a Cisco Networkers 1999 conference, uh, and I had a teal, it was iMac colored, think different shirt with the entire spiel on the back. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Cisco did not want me to wear that on the conference floor, all the oh. student helpers. So they took our clothing and promised to take care of it. Everybody else got their clothes back. I didn't get my Apple shirt back. It's probably worth a mint now on eBay. <laughs> so you had a walk home shirtless? Uh, I had to wear my stupid Cisco shirt home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's go ahead and start the recording. You ready to go? I'll never be ready. All right. Oh, sorry. Time. I have to boot up John emulation mode first. Here we go in three, two, one. Welcome to the Retro Mac cast with James and John. This is episode 573 for June 6, 2021. No John this week. Derek is here. Good morning, Derek. Good morning. This is John Emulation Mode speaking. <laughs> Derek, uh, you might remember him from Mac Folklore Radio. It's been some time. Since Nobody remembers me from Mac Folklore Radio. My listeners are they, extremely depressing. What do they remember <laughs> you from? Oh, probably <laughs> Maybe from, from this show. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> we were looking it up. Uh, the last time you were officially on the show was November of 2018 where you provided an update. I guess you were you were sort of rebooting your podcast after a long hiatus. And then uh, you were you were you chimed in briefly when we were starting this this YouTube experiment last year. Uh, shortly May. after lockdown hit, yeah. Yeah, we happened to catch you in the chat and then we started experimenting with um, sharing each other's screens and, and seeing what, what possibilities might might be available to us. So so that was fun. And I can't believe it. So and then and then before that the because in, in twenty eighteen it was just a few minutes you were on the show, but last time you were guest host was when did we say it? Two thousand twenty middle no, of twenty fourteen somewhere. Oh, 2014. Yeah. You probably invited me a couple of times, but I figure, you uh, know, most of what I have to talk about is not collecting. That's my entire collection right there. It's more about the history, uh, which uh, seems to be a little less appealing to people. Derek, um, in addition to his podcast, he is also, I was going to say the unofficial, maybe I should make you the official archivist of um, of our podcast. He oh, which reminds me, history. I should update the episode guide. I haven't done that in a few months. <laughs> the episode guide. I, do you remember what episode you... Uh, first joined us as a listener oh, god uh 2007 it was april i was at a terrible job getting high off our own supply i think we talked about the mac 2 si which rhymes so it was only yeah so it was only 
five months in to this. Wow. That was, was right. You emailed me out of the blue and said, hey, I think we have a common audience. <laughs> never heard of you before. <laughs> Those were the days. Those were. Well, um, we'll talk more about your podcast. Introduce it for those that aren't familiar and find out what's going on with it a little later in the show. It's mostly about that, yes. And, uh, of course, we got the usual eBay finds we're going to get to here in a minute. And news, Worldwide Developers Conference, coming up tomorrow. That's exciting. So uh, why don't we take a quick break and we'll be back with eBay finds. Right. I sent you a few links. I'll I'll flash them up here on the screen. I'm you uh, can, uh, I'm honored, wise. Steve. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not too many people love my podcast, and uh, the few listeners that I have were original subscribers from 2006. So I basically <laughs> utterly failed to attract new listeners, and I just gave up. Really well. Cool. At least you're not losing the old ones. Uh, well, how do you how do you even know that uh, uh, that I, you uh, have the same listeners? I'm an like, old I don't fan. have that information. Oh, <laughs> I watch my web server logs. Yeah. And uh, after my brief ten year hiatus, I redirected the old RSS feed to the new one, and okay. I just I just thought that'd be like a convenience fallback thing, and I immediately had five hundred people downloading my podcast that I didn't invite. I'm like, where the heck are these people coming from? Oh, they're coming through the redirect. These are people who are still subscribed from 2006. Oh, I see. <laughs> uh, so like uh, pale ale, those who like it, like it a lot, apparently. Mm. All right, let's let's uh, well, let's get on with it. Steve has let's invited me to be another non-photogenic guest on his show. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> we'll we, we, we need to talk, Steve. Possibly. All right, let's uh, let's go with eBay finds. Let's start in three, two, one. It's time for eBay finds. Last week, the iPhone sales training workbook. Look at that! Doesn't that iPhone look smaller? Those hands look big. I I don't know which it is, but uh, this one got no bids. The auction ended. Starting bid was ninety dollars. Nobody thought it was worth that much. I hope everybody's read the article about why Apple products use 9.41 a.m. as the time. If not, you should Google that right now. 9.41, oh my gosh. So you're not going to tell us. You're going to make people look it up. I might be sneakily concealing the fact that it's uh, 6 in the morning here and I've totally forgotten the answer. <laughs> hey. There is a reason. Yeah, there's 14, usually a 14, reason. 14 years have passed since I've been on. We're old now. We're allowed to forget stuff. That's, that's the, uh, the trivia question of the day. Why 941? All right. And uh, oops, let's move along to the next one. Um, another color classic. This one in Australia. We brought this one up because Michael was with us last week. 32 bids drove this one. And it's not even particularly good shape. I don't even think it was necessarily running, was it? Um, but it got up to 355 Australian dollars, which translates to about 275 U.S. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the promotional edition of Inside Macintosh. A.K.A. the phone book. The phone book. That one, what happened to that one? Did it sell? It says the listing has ended, uh, sold, yes, for $75. Okay, we will begin this week with this item. More training. Last week was the iPhone training. This is global sales training for Macintosh, and it comes to you in this little handy sliding card. Sell a Mac. From the minute a customer takes the Mac out of the box to get the best user experience, Mac OS X is built to be easy to use, stable, and secure. And then it's got this little these little cutouts in the card. And so I guess you're supposed to slide this thing in, and it would highlight a picture on the product line. Like in this picture, it's showing MacBook. And then uh, it highlights for consumers why you would want this, for students and for business professionals, and what it includes in the box. 
And look at the beautiful production value on display here. This is classic Apple. I mean, if this were part of the retail packaging today, you'd get a post-it note with a URL pointing you to read it on a web page somewhere. It wasn't necessary to, to create two cardboard outlines for the internal card, but they did. They could have just printed it on on a single sheet of paper and gone home. I know. No, they put a lot it on of... nice cardboard stock and yeah, with a matte finish. I, I, I don't know. Would you like quiz yourself maybe on this? Because you certainly, if you were, um, if you were in front of the customer, you wouldn't have this thing out in front of you to refer to. So maybe it was designed that you could uh, test yourself on on this. So like your Mac Mini, um, it almost looks like uh, every computer is good for for everybody. I don't. I don't see students under Mac Mini. I don't. I don't know why. Because uh, it only had two fifty six megs of RAM in the base model, <laughs> and it even had uh, AirPort in there as well. So it was. Looks like it was two sided. Um, a cute little little relic, probably. Like you said, because you know many things have obviously have gone web based or or otherwise, you know, electronically. Um, I bet. This was probably the end of an era, right? Of of things like this handed out to to train people on the product line because I mean this is fairly late. You're talking about OS 10, and um, so this they want a buy it now of forty nine dollars and ninety five cents, or you can make an offer. It ships from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Never seen one of these before. Yeah. Kind of, kind of cool little item there to set up next to your little Macintosh display. Do you think it's worth forty nine dollars and ninety five cents? Uh, for the rabid collector, which <laughs> clearly not, uh, no way. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't think so either. All right, how about this for the rabid co collector? Ooh. A twentieth anniversary Macintosh setup. Um, the description. Well, why don't do you want to take this one? Uh, I, I I can keep reading. <laughs> you keep reading, and I will find right. some snarky. Comments. This is this one in the title. It says the nicest you will find. Uh, it does seem to be in very good shape. Said. It does. It says uh, comes with all accessories, software, original sales receipt. Which uh, does this mean? This is original owner. Um, doesn't say that. But that's the implication. If if unless the receipt changed hands as well, you get the software, um, books, colored stickers. And the pens, remote control. It says there's not another TAM in this condition with all the accessories available on eBay or anywhere. Very exclusive item. There's one little scratch on the bottom left face. And this is the only blemish. Works well, powers up, um, been in temperature controlled storage. I don't see, no, no boxes though. That does sound like a serious collector. Uh, Steve Mac eighty four points out that uh, that looks like the black G or that looks like the Geoport adapter, uh, the twentieth anniversary Macintosh Cray Geoport adapter, which I didn't even that know is. existed. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Yeah. So you got the little pen set. Um, I took my pen set the other day, and the the plastic it started to degrade and get really sticky. Uh. Um. One thing you want to look on this is for like fraying on the cords. I don't, I can't see a picture that, that goes in to show the the you know the the main connector between the subwoofer and uh, the 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 rest of the computer. Um, this one, boy, they want a starting bid of four thousand seven hundred seventy-seven dollars. Tams haven't gotten that high yet, are they? I, I can't believe. As somebody who hasn't looked at retro Mac prices lately, especially. Um, fanatic models like this one, that actually sounds quite reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it is. I figured it would start at 10,000, something like that. Oh, no, 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 no. I think, um, I think good, good examples are still hovering in the thousand plus area. No people in the chat room says, but, um, that's, uh, seems a little steep. Unfortunately, there's no make an offer. So we, um, I, it's doubtful this will sell. We'll see. I mean, but these are always always uh, opportunities to see, well, may, maybe this will get that, and maybe this will, you know, it, start it does raising copy, the prices. It, it does seem to come with a copy of Somatic Antivirus or Norton Utilities for the Macintosh, so oh, yeah. I can't believe this hasn't sold yet. <laughs> uh, this was Gil Emilio's pet project at Apple. Did you know that? His pet project, really? Uh, so... This is where I get to plug my podcast. This is I All love right. giving historical context to things. 
Uh, if you look no, at wait, the... Wait, hold on one second before you say that. I, I switched it to the apron. That's our next <laughs> auction. That, this is not as pet project, although it could have been also. I, I we're still talking about as, the TAM. If only the apron had been his pet project, he would have screwed everything up at Apple in the 90s. Um, but apparently, if you look at the uh, Computer History Museum's oral history of John Rubenstein, Apple's senior VP of hardware engineering, he said that was Gil's pet project, which he tried to kill a few times. Uh, mm -hmm. It took more than three years to design. By the time it was finally ready to be sent off to manufacturing, many of the parts had been discontinued by the manufacturers, so they had to do lifetime buys on everything. And there was zero, zero design for manufacturing, which is why there's 16 ribbon cables in the thing. So thanks, Gil. Yeah, and of course, Johnny, I've worked on this. Oh, uh, <laughs> Steve Mac 84 points that even the introduction on stage of the 20th anniversary Mac was an awkward, uh, an awkward <laughs> event. It hung and then simple beeped 20 times in a row. It's great. You should see it at WWC 97 uh, with Waz. All right. Now. The apron. Um, the title says Apple Computer Macintosh Authorized Distributor Apron from 1990. Uh, let's see. Unused item. It says it was a promotional apron of an Apple Computer Authorized Distributor with the names of Maru Benny and Computer Wave on it. So on the lower right, I guess, if you're looking at the apron laying down, you see those two companies but it does have a six color apple logo it says apple computer authorized distributor it's all white with uh, red um ties and uh, the neck band um this, i don't think that's that's not embroidered though right it's like a screen print it looks like it's still screened sorry i'm just having a moment of cognitive dissonance here why yes. do apple distributors get aprons i'm not really sure <laughs> What the theme here? Uh, yeah, is? I don't know. Is it because um, you? Is it because dealers were required to buy a hundred thousand dollars worth of product from Apple per year, so they can't eat anymore? I don't know what the motive was, but oh god, there is no story here. Um, it seems like we'd be owed a story. Now this is it shifts from Japan, right? So we often see these kind of strange promotional Apple logoed and authorized items coming out of Japan. They had a, a different set of rules over there with what they were doing. Um, you'd think uh, the starting bit of two hundred fifty dollars would give us a little more of the story behind this, but it, it doesn't. Two fifty, no, make an offer. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, if uh, if you got a if you're a completist, want to have everything that ever had the six color logo, this is this is a unique unique find. I've I've not seen another apron like this. Is that even a, there's a pocket on the front. I think it looks like it's probably sized for your message pad too. So, <laughs> and it doesn't look like it's been used. It's still very, yeah. crisp. looks like it was recently unfolded. Just oh, right, this photo. right, it's right. Very crisp. Um, this one has three days to go. We'll see if it gets its $250 next week. Okay. 250. My God, I didn't say anything because I thought it was $2 and 50 cents. <laughs> <laughs> Now two hundred and fifty dollars. All right. Let's see. Okay, I think you're 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 on next, so I will just shut up and you'll just talk, huh? Uh, no, I'm kidding. Yeah, because you gave me exactly half an hour's notice of the subject. <laughs> That's a lot. All right. Let's roll. Uh, you're you're typing second. away. What are, what are you doing? Are you sending emails? Give me a sec here. Uh huh. Uh, All right. Let me know when you're ready to go, and uh, we'll get going. All right. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one. Well, like I said earlier, it's been a while since we've caught up with Derek in any substantial way. He's been cranking along at a pretty regular note. I think um, 
even better than monthly. You've been putting out episodes of the podcast for a I of aim years for now. every three weeks or so. Three uh, weeks. It, it, it does take a long time to produce these things. Uh, well, Derek is a perfectionist. <laughs> a 10 minute podcast might take uh, uh, nine or 10 hours of recording, editing, post production. Uh, it's an audiobook. It's not just uh, well. It's more than it's. It's a little more than talk radio. So uh, yeah. you want your audiobooks to be nice and clean and not have any mouth noise. Whereas you might be more tolerant of that in other situations. Right. And you have a you have a special room, right? You don't podcast from the living room or wherever you are now. Oh yes, an absolutely specially designed, acoustically treated room, aka my closet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, but is the closet? Is it? Um, it's not lined or otherwise sound it, insulated? It is a garden variety closet. It's a great oh, place okay. to record uh, echo-free audio, so it doesn't sound like you're in a tiny metal box because there's lots of clothes in there. Yeah. Well, uh, you sound fine coming from the living room right now. I'm, I'm looking at the, your background. There's a couple of props there. Did you, did you want to talk about what you have behind you besides the the uh, furniture? If I touch my camera, I'll be able to focus. I have a... <laughs> I have a Starmax. It's really hard to point at things that are reversed on the screen. Yes. Starmax 4400-200. So that's a PowerPC 604E uh, 200 megahertz clone from Motorola. Does that Was that one that you, was that one you absconded with from, from a school? Or uh, where did you get that from, one? From, from my employer, yes. Yeah. When you, when you work at a large public institution, uh, first of all, there's a lot of old junk lying, lying around. And then coworkers say, hey, look at this old PC I found. And I went... <gasps> That's there's no, no PC. Eject but, there's no eject button on the floppy drive. That could only mean one thing. My God, it's true. And then I saw the PowerPC logo at the bottom right. I'm like, wow, it's a 604E. All right. <laughs> uh, that's also how I got the uh, PowerBook 5300. It was sitting on somebody's shelf. And uh, mm -hmm. I do have co a compact flash card in there that's gone bad, so I can't boot it up. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. in the middle of recapping the power supply for the Star Max and plan mm -hmm. to learn... Uh, uh, I should go back and listen to your episode, John's Recap Recap, uh, to learn about uh, SMD electrolytic resoldering. Right. Well, anyway, um, MacFolkloreRadio.com is where you go to listen to Derek's podcast. And you've been putting out episodes since when? When, when was the first one? Do you remember? How far uh, back does it go? I, I'm looking. I started up in uh, 2006, and that original run was just stories from Andy Hertzfeld's Folklore.org. And that ran for three years until I got sick of that and moved on. Are those even years. available? Uh, they are. So there's a classic section at the top. Oh, there it is. In the navigation bar. And you can download all my old terrible readings that you should definitely not listen to. I'm actually going back and rereading some of the folklore.org stories now that I have a little more experience and better equipment. Oh, uh, and then publishing them in the main feed? Yes, that's right. I need to go and update the archives as well. Okay. Uh, but I started in 2018, and last year, when uh, we were all suddenly quarantined, I decided, oh, I better keep people entertained and crank out lots of episodes. It's on you, yes. Yes, uh, it was entirely my responsibility <laughs> worldwide. And, of course, nobody was listening because nobody was commuting to work. Thus, podcast listenership globally was down anywhere from 10 to 25%, depending on who you listen to. So, oh, wow. Uh, but I hope somebody enjoyed them. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. So that 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 book has has been the focus of most of uh, your audio recordings. But uh, you have been doing other things. Actually, um, most of the new run is focused on editorials and interviews. Uh, Stephen Levy had a great mm -hmm. series of editorials in Macworld magazine called "The Iconoclast," which is what I frequently read from. Uh, by the way, Mac user is well, you already know. For the people who uh -huh. don't know, Mac User Magazine is also on archive.org these days and vintageapple.net. Thank you very much. And I'll be plucking out some editorials from there. And, of course, David Pogue occasionally has hilarious reviews. The printer in seat 7A. This is all about portable printers. And this is one of the reasons why I'm passionate about bringing you history. Um, there are a lot of, I'm sorry to use the term, kids out there who are looking at old computer magazines and wondering how common things were and coming mm -hmm. away with the wrong impression because, or in my opinion, the incorrect impression, because they're just reading the Wikipedia article, article on things. I'm here to give you some real world on the ground historical context from back in the day about these things. Uh, for example, did you ever see anybody at all throughout the 1990s with a portable printer? 
Uh, I can't say one. that I did. It was uh, that one. was a very a, very much a luxury item, at it least was. among regular consumers. It was. So mm -hmm. I don't know why people pick up these things from Wikipedia or put them in there, but uh, they yeah. do. And of course, this is reflected in David Pogue's tip number one, which my DSLR is not focusing on, saying uh, the best one of the best options for portable printing is not to carry one at all. You could use your PowerBook's fax modem, if you have one, to fax your document to the hotel business lobby or business lounge <laughs> or whatever, which would give you much better output than some of the $1,000 portable inkjet printers that just smeared all over the place. Right, right. That's funny. Good tip. Good tip. Yeah. Um, I was listening earlier. You had your your um, reading of David Pogue's PowerBook Duo and Duo Doc Review was, was interesting. Um, I do love the sneaking around at Apple and garbage bins uh, set of articles, Code and Dagger and the Dirt on Apple Security, about the new Prometheus League. Yeah. The start of Apple's culture of secrecy, which is what we think is destroying the quality of Mac OS today, unfortunately. And I liked that. Uh, and I, I was actually, I was listening to uh, Quick Hide in the Closet um, this morning. And, um, and he had the little uh, audio clip of Bill Gates there at the beginning, um, which, uh, which I love that, that uh, ability to, to pull stuff like in there. And then you have almost like a little, little audio documentary. Yeah. Of sorts. I, uh, so t uh, plugging my podcast, the road to mm -hmm. power Macintosh has about, uh, seven minutes worth of, of audio clips of interviews with uh, the guy who wrote the 68K emulator for the first Power Max. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also talks about how Apple was not alone in that Sun Microsystems also got fed up with Motorola in the 1980s because it took them, you know, six years to fix the fact that there was no memory management unit, you couldn't take page faults. Uh, so they decided to design their own processor. Uh, and the Why Did Apple Kill Newton article, I think that's got about 15 minutes of audio clips uh, of interviews with people. Um, the great thing about history is they just keep making more of it. And yeah. <laughs> I used to stick to a very strict format, like, oh, this is a serious thing. I can't put in interview clips. But we have so many interviews now, thanks to the Computer History Museum, that uh, I have a great time uh, using all my useless Apple keynote knowledge and interview recall to... Uh, put in audio clips where I can to make it a little more mm -hmm. lively. Oh yeah. No, 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 that, that, that adds a very extra dimension to it. One of my favorite stories. Sorry, I just would jump in. Yeah. So the, so we know that arm has sort of taken over the world and it certainly killed off Intel in the Apple world. Did you know that acorn computers who made the BBC micro in the UK, they were looking for a replacement processor for the six five Oh two, which is in the Apple two and more or less in the mm -hmm. number 64, et cetera. And they approached a number of people, including Intel, uh, about using their CPUs. They said, hey, Intel, 286 is actually a pretty good chip, but it's, uh, you couldn't possibly make a good computer out of this. The address pins and the data pins on the CPU, on your CPU, are shared. That's impossible. Why don't mm -hmm. you give us the die and we'll do a real CPU? And mm -hmm. Intel said, get lost. So they went <laughs> off and designed the ARM, which has gone on to eat Intel's lunch. <laughs> <laughs> in mobile and in the Apple domain. Right, right. Okay, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Cool stories like that. Well, um, and I have to thank um, you, James, for uh, inspiring uh, Steve thinking. Chamberlain, who was on uh, the podcast a few times. Yeah. I think your interviews with him went on to inspire him to write uh, the history of Tetris Max, which I also read, I think it was last May, the story of Tetris Max. Oh, interesting. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so what uh let's see you you put out may 30th the quick high in the closet what do you have one in production right now uh, i've always got a couple in production usually riding the ragged edge of disaster uh i think i'm going to redo a brief history of claris works which uh, uh -huh. i didn't read so well back in 2007 uh -huh. and i think i'm going to read an interview with darren adler do you know who that is I don't see. This is why I like bringing people history. A lot of unknown names. There were people. There were people other than Jobs working at Apple. As it turns out, uh, <laughs> you mean Jobs didn't do everything, write everything, and design everything? Thankfully. <laughs> uh, so Darren Adler worked at Icom Simulations. So you, you remember the Mac Venture series, Deja Vu? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, he worked there when he was a kid, and he went on to work on System Seven Point Oh. Okay. 
uh, at Apple in the 90s and uh, was poached by General Magic. So he's also in the General Magic documentary, which you should right. definitely see. And Great documentary. And went on to found the Safari team. Oh, wow. And he has a little thing on his website where he talks at great length about his personal history with computing and Apple. Uh, it was last updated in 1996, but hey, it's really cool. Uh-huh. So, so you get permission from him? How does that work? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, technically, so <laughs> folklore.org is all under a Creative Commons license. And yes. You could argue I'm committing blatant copyright uh, violations by reading you old Macworld articles. Nobody cares about 30-year-old articles. <laughs> if I was reading you things from the LA Times yesterday, yeah, that might be a problem. But uh, I haven't gotten that. I haven't been slapped with any legal notices yet. I'm not doing it for profit. I'm not even asking for donations. Right. So we'll call it a gray area. And nobody's subscribed. Nobody's listening. <laughs> I feel nobody's I'm quite listening. safe, actually. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, we didn't want to worry about you on that front. Well, um, uh, and if it, there are any yeah. article or topic ideas that uh, people have out there, I'm happy to take requests. Derek at MacFolkloreRadio.com or stick it in the chat. Perfect. And then go on over to MacFolkloreRadio.com to download. Is it is it listed in some of the, the larger, like in, in the iTunes podcast? I did yank it while I was idle, but it is back uh, in the iTunes podcast directory, and from there it's okay. trickled down to Stitcher. Um, <laughs> you, you said you said you did yank it. You meant you removed it from iTunes. I, I thought there was another service called Yank It that uh, I'm not aware of. There's all these, oh, um, probably some sort of crazy <laughs> podcast subscription. I'm gonna go ahead and that, register Yank It Duck. Yeah, pulls it to your phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, again, it's MacFolkloreRadio.com. All right. That was mildly well, nerve-wracking. No, no, that was, that was uh, Pat, great. Patrick in the chat is asking, is that a book, Tetris Max, a blog or what? So uh, Steve Chamberlain, the guy, so Tetris Max is a famous uh, Macintosh version of Tetris. Uh, it was huge in the 90s, written by Steve Chamberlain, the guy who does Floppy Emu. Uh, and he wrote up the story of how he... He was in college, wanted a copy of Tetris, thought the official Spectrum Holobyte port of Tetris for the Mac sucked, which it did. There was no soft drop. What the hell? Um, and decided to write his own. And, you know, he didn't know C and he didn't know toolbox programming, but he was at MIT. He was capable of learning that. And he did. And unfortunately decided to call it Tetris Max rather than something else. Which yeah. got, into, <laughs> Get into got into trouble. a bit of trouble later. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move on to some news. Oh, Steve Mac eighty four just said he emailed me. Thank you very much, Steve. That's uh, I think that's like the fifth email I've gotten about the podcast this year. All right, fourth. Can I, let's, <laughs> let's start in three, two, one. Well, the big event that we're waiting for is Worldwide Developers Conference coming we're up waiting tomorrow. For this? I I can't wait. Are for you this not moment. waiting? Oh, these don't these don't get you excited, I guess, because you're. You're really interested in the hardware. The I'm really hardware. interested in a high quality, simple, elegant user interface design operating system, which we don't have anymore and haven't had for 10 years. Oh my goodness. As soon as Tim Cook comes out on the stage and says, we love the Mac, I just want to vomit all over my desk because you don't <laughs> love the Mac, Tim. If you loved the Mac, you would rip out the culture of secrecy, let the developers talk to each other, polish up the, the bugs, and get it a release we could finally all love again. But wow. nobody has done that. Okay. It, Mac OS is just rotting <laughs> into the ground. I've never been more ashamed <laughs> to be a Mac user. I'm not switching, but I'm not happy. Well, that, but anyways, uh, yes, WWDC 20. Yeah. 20, 20, 20, 20. <laughs> I, I, well, I mean, it's... Um... What else What else do you need from your app race at this point? Do we, I mean, we're, we're up to what OS... 12 or something like that potentially being released tomorrow um what are they going to do besides add more bugs um emojis um at this point i don't know so yeah i i'm not terribly excited about the the os side which is obviously the emphasis of this we're just i'm really hoping that we see some new hardware announcements um which are not guaranteed uh um, the global chip shortage is also quite uh quite scary i don't know how much new hardware we're going to see yeah, yeah. Well, um, 
there is a chance, I suppose, that um, we'll see some some MacBook Pros sporting probably a new iteration of the M1. I would love to see 15-inch M1 because the Air is great. It's too small for me. Yeah. So you're on board with the uh, the Apple Silicon transition. Uh, I bought the Air as a throwaway machine just because I wanted all my M1 questions answered. And I'm glad to see everybody in the chat room uh, <laughs> agrees with me about Apple software quality assurance. Thank you. Did you get your questions answered? How, how has it been? Uh, it's absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, yeah. it's, it's twice as fast as my uh, six-core mini in, uh, in some test cases. Uh -huh. And Rosetta 2, absolutely perfect, down to the point of running audio plugins, which we couldn't do with <laughs> the original Rosetta. That was quite a disaster, right. but oh, you yeah. just wouldn't even know it was happening now. That's great. Yeah, I, um, I'm considering, and I'm just waiting for the right, the right model and the time before I make that jump. Yeah. Although my my mom has a has a green iMac on the way. Oh, very nice. Mm -hmm. My mother is which still means using a, still using a Core Two Duo uh, from two thousand nine, early two thousand nine. When she upgrades, I'll I'll get her current iMac and it'll add up onto my display of of iMacs. Yeah, yeah. One of the reasons I didn't want to buy an Air was that I figured it'd be underpowered. This thing is so fast. Mm -hmm. The SSD writes at three gigs a second and reads at 2.4. Don't ask me why it reads slower than it writes, but it's just unbelievably fast. So uh, I was going to just sell it, but it's so good. I think I'll keep it uh, even after they release a 15 inch M1. All right. I could do with a 15 inch air Apple. If you're listening, we just heard Steve <laughs> jobs actually proposed that in 2007, but uh, oh well. Yeah. Well, speaking of Steve jobs, there's an article over on, uh, actually, I'll switch over here, on Inc. 14 years ago, Steve Jobs sent the most important email in the history of business. So Apple just uh, concluded their participation in this um, little legal battle, right, that they're, they're involved in with Epic over the terms of the App Store. Of course, Epic tried to sidestep some of the, uh, the conditions to which they had um, signed up for. And uh, without getting into all the, the nitty gritty of, of that, what often happens during these lawsuits is uh, the disclosure, the uncovering of, of supporting evidence and, and information that, that to this point we had never seen. And so in that was this, this email um, sent, let's see, it was, it was a back and forth, right, between uh, Bertrand Serlet and... Steve Jobs back in 2007, they were discussing about the future of iPhone and the possibility of native apps. And it turns out to be a pretty significant email. Uh, let's see. I'll go down here. Here, here it is. I zoom in. On, oh, of course, it's low res. I can't even, I can't even read it. Um, but it says, sure, as long <laughs> as we can uh, roll it out all on Macworld January 15th, 2008. In other words, Bertrand Serlet cared about quality, other people did not, which seems to be a recurring theme at Apple these days, especially in the software department, not bitter. Yeah, Bertrand laid out all, a, a, a list of four conditions about how they would do native apps for uh, third-party developers. And uh, Steve, you know, in his typical quick responses, um, responded to, in support. But he also gave them like, what, like three months? to lay it all out. I don't think, I don't think they, they didn't actually have it like instituted. So developers could start writing in three months. I think um, it was announced in three months. Right. Um, uh, but they had he, to, they had, they fig had to at least figure out how they were going to do it. So they didn't announce something they couldn't pull off. Uh, in Bertrand Serlet and Steve Jobs defense, uh, they didn't roll it out. They didn't roll out the SDK at Macworld. There's a special event in March, 2008, which you should go and watch. Cause it was really yeah. cool. Um, but they did, well, so instead of doing the impossible in three months, they did it in five months. Mind you, they've already had a, f they've already had a few years of development at that point. That was around the era of iOS 3.0. Um, right. So, yeah, they had obviously developed them themselves. They had to right. figure out how to, how to do it, so let other people do not it. Not quite to... as stark as the clickbait headline would have you believe. They did have right. some time to refine these things. It's not like they threw together the entire API in three months. Sure. But anyway, this that whole thing was to support Apple's argument, I guess, that uh, this was a very 
there's a lot of consideration that was in this and it wasn't, the rules weren't designed to screw Epic. Um, it was actually in this from the beginning, how they were going to make sure that they, they uh, had uh, security and uh, quality control and everything in mind from the beginning. All right, here, let's go retro with this tattoo. Do you, you don't have an Apple tattoo. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any tattoos. I'm just not. Kind of guy. <laughs> Sorry, I just want to point out the chat room is already debating how yeah. long it's going to take to collect all the colors of every all of the new M1 IMAX. Uh, you people are crazy. <laughs> how long is how, how long is for who to collect for well, any of us? Well, I don't know. Depends on how rich you are, I guess. Yeah, you could do it right now. Just just put your put your orders in. Um, it would be cool to have them all, but. At what price? You know, it's going to take a long time before those those lose much of their value. I mean, we've we've seen how long um, modern Macs keep their value and their usability, right? I mean, you can heck ten years old and it's still pretty useful. These minis, or oh. I mean, these um, excuse me, these M1 Macs probably will last even longer because they're already starting off so powerful. So yeah, I think it'd be a while before you're you're picking up these colored IMAX for you know twenty bucks plus shipping. Come back in um, episode three thousand. We'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, over here on um, Reddit, the who's the the person? It's it's Intrepid Interview Six. Got a tattoo. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Stephen Jobs with a uh, smiley classic Mac. Susan Care Design logo and some uh, cute flowers around it. Um, nice to see that there's still some some retro Mac fans out there uh, honoring it like this. It's kind of kind of funny, but it's a good it's a good mashup between the original Mac and a, Steve, a more modern Steve Jobs quote. Uh, I was about to say, going back to my earlier point about uh, younger people who weren't necessarily there. Um, I wonder how long before we're going to get an, an, uh, an anachronistic, uh, Steve Jobs Macintosh tattoo. <laughs> One of my favorite YouTube, uh, poster frames with somebody with their hands up in the air and their mouth open explaining something, mm -hmm. uh, is Steve Jobs biggest mistakes. And they've got a Mac plus, which Jobs is not present for and an Apple two GS, which Jobs had nothing to do with <laughs> the frame. not mentioning any names. Those might've been counter examples, but still. Yeah. I wonder about the impression people are getting. It's been a while since we checked in on, on Dana Sabera, aka uh -oh. Nano Raptor, and, what and her thing creations. Have we created this week. <laughs> oh, you don't remember this one? Uh, I think this was in the late nineties. Oh, this was the sorry, Apple. I just, I just saw the bre I just saw the bunny ears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the uh, the Macintosh bunny. Benui. B B N U U Y. It was um. A short-lived model that uh, was using Wi-Fi um, long before it appe would appear in the uh, clamshell iBook. <laughs> there was a move to put it in classic Macs inside of these dual antennas. Um, you, you might also be able to pop popcorn between those. I don't know. <laughs> or you uh, could line them up all in a row and have crenellations for your castle. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. And then, what is this one? This was that ah. uh, says um, the Macintosh Lindy. I guess that's how you pronounce that. Was intended to be Apple's multimedia CAD comms and DTP workstation. Hands While up, who carried... hands up, who recognizes the design cue, or what that's a reference to? Anybody? I don't know. You any mean other, the name? Any other Unix freaks out there? Okay, so you need to uh, grab a new tab and Google image search uh, SGI Indie. Oh. Is it reminiscent of that? Which has an interesting sheer design that's uh, split kind of like that. Yeah. Oh, all right. I'm going to dangerously oh. SGI. Brian Bijou got it. SGI. SGI Indie. Yes. Oh. So, notice, so it's a flat piece of rectangle, but they, they yeah. sliced it and shifted it. There you go. <laughs> Which... Uh, <laughs> That's probably a little more practical. At least the the top is is level. Um, the the Macintosh two indie or whatever. So I, that's where it is. It's a Macintosh two indie. 
um, one of the clever comments was that the, uh, the, the you know, people that, that use these things would, would buy two and then reverse one and set it on top of the other. So you could actually stack a monitor on the pair. Um, uh. Very awesome. And then I got one more here. This was a experiment. Oh. There was a, there was a time, you know, because some technology is, is cyclical, right? And please the, tell the me idea, that's a tw- please tell me that's a Twiggy. The idea that a five and a quarter inch drive actually might be the way to go uh, on the Bondi Blue iMac, and so there's her rendition of how that would look, <laughs> complete with the, uh, the little swing down. Of course, you had to have a little uh, little access. Um, what do you call that thing? The little sw- the flip the latch the, the door the flip the latch yeah, yeah. right. Uh, it's too bad I they didn't. Uh, had they gone back, they should have done a, a version of the final corner inch with it auto ejected. You know, so you knew it was a Mac. <laughs> they do have auto eject uh, five and a quarter inch drives. I think did they? Uh, oh, sorry. not an I'm Apple. Th- I'm thinking of the Twiggy. The Twiggy actually had an auto eject mechanism. Did you know that? What? Yeah. It. it uh, at least I the one that, that I saw on YouTube does. I don't personally have it, Lisa. All right. Uh, in case well. I haven't encouraged people to go out and listen to the Computer History Museum's oral histories, John Rubenstein, senior uh, hardware engineering VP, talks about a story where he was in a meeting one day and he got a call from this insane person shouting at him, like shouting obscenities at him on the phone. And he puts down the phone and his secretary walks in and goes, uh, I think Steve Jobs wants to see you. And Steve was throwing a fit because he was practicing the rollout event for the original iMac in 98, points to the optical drive tray and says, what's that? He says, well, that's the CD drive. He's like, well, what is this tray? It's like, well, that's the tray. That's how they work. It's like, well, I want it to be like my car where I just shove the CD into the slot. I was like, well, they don't make right. those trays yet. So uh, they had a huge fight about that. And eventually Steve had to put his arm around John's shoulder and say, you know what? This is a, I'm a friend, do this as a personal favor for me. And uh, that's how we got the rush production of the uh, slot loading IMAX and uh, drives when they became available. I can't believe that that's the, the first time he noticed that, the first time he was shown that the IMAX was going to have a tray. I, I guess that when you're a busy executive. <laughs> it's a cool story, though. <laughs> All right. Uh, again, you can go on to Twitter and follow Dana at Nano Raptor. She's coming up with these these cool creations all the time. And many of them, not not this one. A lot of them, you'll scratch your head and say, "Gosh, I don't remember that." And there's a reason why you don't remember it because it never existed until it did in in her mind. All right. I uh, I did some googling. Did somebody else, did anybody in the chat figure out why that uh, iPhone is set at 941? I didn't want to look it up because my keyboard is too loud. So whoever was asking about my keyboard earlier, it's a 2020 Unicomp Model M. It's just um, it's just the, the time when Steve Jobs announced iPhone in 2007, about 42 oh, minutes into funny. his keynote address. Okay. And he said the words, today Apple is going to reinvent the phone. And yet I forgot And so that. the picture, I guess it's 942. And so the picture showed up behind him on cue, 942, which I don't remember. I, I, I kind of remember the story about, you know, that's why we see it subsequently. I don't remember it showing up on cue during the presentation with the, with the time right as he's unveiling it so now i got to go back and watch the keynote and see that's how it went down i have a copy of my archives i have to check look it up all right well let's um while you do that why don't we close out the episode and uh we'll do that right now in three two one that brings us to the end of another episode of the retro mac cast next week um derek will be back busy producing his next episode of Mac Folklore Radio. John will be back at his festival. John will give us a report from the Renaissance Festival. And we will talk about Mac stuff, probably, 
hopefully we'll we'll be super excited about what was announced at WWDC. With any because other. Tim loves the Mac. <laughs> we haven't forgot about the Mac. We love the Mac. That is funny. He does say that a lot. A lot. It's he shouldn't sickening. have to say that. It should be evident in the actions. Uh, yeah, company. me thinks he doth protest too much. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I just noticed we've had a guest all along. I'm sorry, Steve. I didn't notice you sitting there in the uncomfortable Apple director's chair. <laughs> oh, yeah, behind me. All right. Well, um, until next week, remember, it's not old. It's retro. There, I thought you were going to forget. I was not prepared for <laughs> that. Hesitated. I actually forgot, but totally forgot. That's what I was <laughs> supposed to say. But I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Oh, <laughs> right, it's the retro podcast. You're on the retro podcast. Do the thing. I've been listening to you guys long enough that uh, <laughs> instinct. It was purely instinct. My brain was not. Are you pulling that. up that that segment of? Um, I guess I could even throw it up here in the screen here about the, the the exact moment when Steve Jobs announced iPhone. Oh, it's sad. All these keynotes that were worth watching back in the iPhone day. iPhone announcement 2007. Let's fast forward to the end. See, this is why I wasn't looking for it earlier. 42 minutes in. Is what they said. Uh, I'm going to find it. Oh, yeah. So 42. So 41 minutes and 45 seconds, but the clock says 9.55. <laughs> what? So you're, so you're right. Yeah, I'll send you a. I guess I. Can I paste pictures in here? No, I'm I trying can't. To... So, Thanks, so is... $8 billion corporation. I can't stick pictures in the YouTube chat. <laughs> I, 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 I'm scrolling through the slides and I, I see it. First display. I don't see the image where the where the time is displayed on it. Okay, I'm going to say this is a JPEG. Stick it on my website and stick the URL in the chat. Take that, Google. Well, well you can you can share your screen and blast it right uh, up there. If you want I could to. do that, but uh, here we go. What do you can post the URL? There's so many ways. Yeah. Technology. I'm old fashioned. Awesome. What are you gonna do? Go. You're gonna. Clock says 9.55 a.m. <laughs> Steve says, if photos could be in YouTube chat, I'd quit being a YouTuber. We pr probably right. Yeah, 9.55. So that story, whatever I wrote, is is wrong. Uh, maybe that's why I forget. Uh, that's going to be my legitimate excuse for forget forgetting the reason. So they must have they must have gone back and figured out exactly. Well, that's the, then then that's the the task is to say, okay, well, according to the actual time on the clock, when did he say those words? Uh, public service announcement on behalf of my friend Mike: If you buy a blue scuzzy kit, that means you get a kit of parts, not something that you can snap together. So, uh, Mike, I've soldered your blue scuzzy. It's ready for you to pick up any time. <laughs> Oh, did you post a link in the oh, chat? Links don't, links don't show in the chat unless you're a host or a mod. Thank you, Steve84. I'm a <laughs> very inexperienced YouTuber. So I'm going to stick some spaces in. Ah, oh, crap. <laughs> so Derek could Skype it to me. Slash media slash clockfail.jpg. There. I, one of those might show up. <laughs> I could Skype it to you. That would, Skype smart, it. that would be the smart thing to do. Oh, I could just send you the picture. Or send me the picture. There we go. Yeah, that would work too. Oh, he sent it to me and to. Oh, yeah, nine fifty-five. Right. Hmm. Well, mystery solved. So, if there's a fifteen-inch MacBook Pro at a WWDC twenty twenty-one, who out there is going to buy it? That was going to be me up until a few months ago. Uh-huh. I don't know. Do you think you're going to make the leap? Is it time? I, I, I don't know. I don't know that. I, I, there, There is, um, even though I don't rely on it, the the option to be able to Always use got to have a backup operating back. systems. Yeah. Because even, um, you know, I'm even virtualizing old versions of Intel-based uh, Mac OSs. One day, 
James, you will have to let go of Levelator. I hate to break it to you, but... Well, <laughs> okay. no, Levelator actually is running now um, in whatever operating system we're in now. But yeah, you're right. I was virtualizing 10.7 to run Levelator, <laughs> but now, no, I can run Levelator native now. So it would uh, Rosetta on an M1 Mac. Um, no, but I have a like I have a collection of old operating systems that every once in a while I find myself and 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 actually I even need it, but it's it's not like I wouldn't get rid of this Mac, so it'd be there to tap into if I needed to go to those options. But um, I can't say that I have any performance problems or issues. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I probably wouldn't have gotten the M1 Mac if I had not damaged the R key while trying to clean my old MacBook Pro. But uh, it's unbelievable. Even compared to a 2013 MacBook Pro, Retina MacBook Pro with an SSD, um, the M1 just feels incredibly fast. I never thought my 2013 Retina MacBook Pro would feel slow. Because mm -hmm. that is already a darn fast SSD for its time. And uh, <laughs> I just can't take it anymore when I go back to it. It's my studio machine now. I record podcasts on it. And then I transfer the stuff elsewhere. Cool. People are sticking with their existing machines in the chat. You know, I didn't realize. So the Raspberry Pi 4 uses micro HDMI. My camera uses mini HDMI. And I just realized the other day that the uh, video out port in the 5300, it's kind of like a mega HDMI. <laughs> it's like a, an oversized regular HDMI port. Although we didn't know it was going to be called that then. Yeah, I'm sure that was some some super proprietary uh, port. I've got the adapter in the other room. There you go. All right. Well, I think we'll um, go ahead and sign off. Thanks, everybody, for for tuning in. PowerBook 5300, the machine with such a crap display, we've got paper creeping out of it, and I haven't figured out why. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to you, Derek, for sitting in for John. Thanks for inviting me. Good to me. see you're doing well. How's uh, how's the pandemic in, in your part of the world? Uh, we were not doing very well with the infection numbers. We were about a thousand a day for a couple of months there. That was quite scary. That's the most we've ever had. We're back down to about 200 a day. Uh, I got vaccinated two weeks ago, and it took two hours, which is way longer than it should have. They had to verify the batch uh, number or something. Mm. Uh, but other people mm. are getting in and out in 20 minutes, so that's good. Uh, well, that's good. I don't know what work's going to look like in September. That will be interesting. Because you're still you're still working from home. Uh, yes, possibly yeah. forever, which uh, might yeah. be good, might be bad. Oh, and I'm curious that uh, Steve Mac eighty four says his fifty three hundred also has paper creeping out of this display. <laughs> I've seen that too. I might have that as well. I don't know what that is. I think it's is like it a, is it paper? I think it's like a post it note from Gil Emilio. P.S. This machine sucks. If you <laughs> <inside>. <laughs> hey Brian, thank you for that. Those nice words. Brian must be one of those those five hundred that follows you to the new Possibly. podcast. Yes, thank you very much, everybody. Great right. to have an audience giving you feedback. And, Thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah. Enjoy we'll uh, we'll see you next week. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.